you introduce when you introduce multiple wills within the godhead you're talking about multiple beings at that point you're you're getting close to that line of polytheism to anderson's borderline polytheistic view of the trinity which is three wills three centers of consciousness and defined persons as we already have seen different wills different positions of authority which is not historical trinitarianism because basically what the church has always meant when it says there are three persons in the godhead is simply someone who can say i to the exclusion of another you know the universal church doesn't exist you guys ever heard of the universal church well all believers are part of this universal invisible church well, that would completely contradict what we see here in 1 Corinthians 5, because how do you cast someone out of the universal church? I mean, do you throw them to another planet? Do you get them out of the solar system? I mean, if, if, if every believer is part of that same church, how do you cast someone out like that? This is only possible with a local, visible New Testament church model. The question is not when did the church start, because there's no such thing as a universal church, which is exactly what the Catholics believe. They believe that there is a universal, we're all part of the, the church, right? There's a universal church. Whereas the Bible does not talk about a universal church. It talks about local New Testament visible churches. Because basically what the church has always meant when it says there are three persons in the Godhead. And the reason why the church has historically used the term persons and has been historically accepted by the church, 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 the church. What are we going to do about this? Like what? This is Joseph Smith. This is, this is Mormonism. And that are true biblical doctrine, and this is why Anderson falls into this uh, this problem. This probably would have never happened had Anderson just simply uh, paid a little bit more attention to church history. Now uh, we're going to get to uh, at near the end of the video uh, to debunking what Anderson actually says about the Trinity and why it's wrong and why it's not historical and not biblical. But for now, let's get to the Athanasian Creed which uh the church the church and has been historically accepted by the church <laughs> that is not what distinguishing that is not how you distinguish between the persons therefore the distinguish the distinction between the persons in the godhead are not wills or powers or hierarchy the way Anderson describes it, but rather it is the eternal relations of origins. As I as we went through the first uh, through my last, uh, we went through in the last podcast. What is it? The Father is is neither begotten nor proceeds from anyone. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father before all ages. He didn't start being begetting uh, begotten in a point of time. He's eternally begotten. The Son of God who is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. He is begotten. He is eternally begotten not begotten at a point in time but begotten from all eternity and always will be begotten now another way to prove this very important doctrine of the eternal generation of the son You know, this is talking about the resurrection. I'm going to prove that without a shadow of a doubt. But uh, Hebrews chapter 5, I just wanted to sh show you these places where this is mentioned. And then I'm going to show you where it's quoted from. Because in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 5, it says, So also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. So notice that there's a specific time in which Jesus was begotten. One that is fully God and one that is fully human. Now, the human part of him was begotten at a point in time, and that is when some of those scriptures are fulfilled of him being begotten at, at his incarnation or his resurrection, but he's also, the divine nature is begotten from all eternity, okay?
for example, when Jesus Christ says in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but thine be done, right? One is submitting unto the other. The son is submitting unto the father in that instance. And, it, and what is the result? Two different wills. Even if they're agreeing, even if the son's agreeing with the will of the father, there is two different wills. Not my will, but thine be done. You introduce, when you introduce multiple wills within the Godhead, you're talking about multiple beings. Now you might be saying, wait a minute, you just debunked yourself. The son is saying there, not my will, but thine be done. He's submitting unto the father. We'll get to that. That's not, we'll get to what that actually means. But That's why it makes sense that when I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me, that's why it's the Son of Man that's sitting there in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane saying that. He is God. He is God the Son saying, I'm not going to do mine own will, but th the will of him that sent me. And by the way, that's the only way that you really have true love is if you have your own free will. And the Father loves the Son, and the Son loves the Father. And if you don't have separate wills, you have robots. You don't have true love if you don't have the choice to actually love somebody. But go to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. So that destroys the whole, well, the different wills is dealing with the flesh and, and, the, and God. God's will and the will of man. Well, that's destroyed because he says, I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. So he's clearly talking about his deity coming down from heaven. But here, what is Calvin saying? No, this is the human nature and speaking to the divine nature. So there are two wills here. There's the human will and there's the divine will. And lastly, this is Calvin's commentary on 1 Corinthians chapter 11. When it says, you know, not mine own will, but thine be done. When he said that in the Garden of Eden, they say that's the flesh, talking about the flesh's will, to God's will. Okay, let's see if that makes sense. Go to John chapter 6 and verse 38. John chapter 6 and verse 38. Jesus is talking, For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Jesus Christ that came down from heaven, the Lord down from heaven said, I am not come to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. So who's the one that says he has a different will? The one that came down from heaven? So for them to say that that's the flesh that came, you know, that was born of Mary, that's its own will, that completely annihilates that. Questions of the independent fundamental Baptist movement itself. They even say things like Lester Roloff is roasting in hell. Lester Roloff wasn't saved. And for those of you who don't know, Lester Roloff was a prominent independent Baptist preacher in the 50s and 60s. Now repentance is a godly sorrow for sin. Repentance is a forsaking of sin. Real repentance is a putting your trust in Jesus Christ so that you'll not live like that anymore. That's repentance. Repentance is permanent. It's a lifelong and eternity long experience. You'll never love the devil again once you repent. You'll never hold hands with him. You'll hit him a few times and every time you can, but you'll never flirt with the devil as the habit of your life again once you get saved. You'll never be happy living in sin. It'll never satisfy. And the husks of the world will never fill your longing and hungering in your soul. Repentance is something a lot bigger than a lot of people think. It's absolutely essential if you go to heaven. The mother's going to give an X no matter what, but if the father gives a Y, now it's going to be a male. How is Jesus Christ, the man Christ Jesus, without a father? He can't be. So who supplied that gender? God did. Every That's the, that guy's the worst. Now, when it looks to the son... We have a clear definition of a separation of wills. Luke 22, look at verse 42. Saying, Father, if thou be willing, no, denote, guess what? If you're willing, that means you have a will. <laughs> 
You could never be willing without a will. Remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. So notice Jesus says this is a difference of wills, doesn't he? Go to John chapter number six. John chapter six. Now, what I've heard from liars, heretics, and false teachers is they'll say, well, the two wills there is Jesus' flesh and his spirit. But you can't separate those, number one. Number two, I can prove to you that's not what he meant. Okay? It's not what he meant. Because look what it says in John chapter 6, verse 38. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him sent me. So notice, when he was in heaven, he didn't do his will. He did the other person's will, which is the Father's will. But in heaven, he wasn't flesh yet in that sense. He was made flesh through the Virgin Mary. He came down from heaven. So notice there was two wills before the birth of Jesus Christ, before the conception of Jesus Christ, before the incarnation of Jesus Christ, before Jesus Christ descended down from heaven, he had a will in heaven, and the Father had a will, and the will of the Father sent the, the Son. He's saying, hey, I didn't come here to do my own will. I'm doing his will. Noting, again, that there's different wills. Go to Mark chapter 13. So first of all, I want to thank Pastor Baker. I appreciate the opportunity always to preach in front of God's people. Um, I never take it lightly. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever.